This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Reed Pence. This week, using dogs to sniff out cancer and other human diseases. There are a lot of skeptics, and so it's hard to do this research because all of the big agencies are like, what are you doing? You're doing this with dogs? You're kidding. Animals who detect human disease when Radio Health Journal returns. A new survey shows a staggering number of family and friends of people with Alzheimer's disease are jeopardizing their own family's health and financial stability. According to the Alzheimer's Association 2016 Alzheimer's Disease Facts and Figures Report, nearly half of care contributors have to cut back on their own expenses and basic needs, such as food and medical care. Beth Kallmeyer is Vice President of Constituent Services for the Alzheimer's Association. Very few people are prepared for the high cost of dementia-related care. More than one-third of care contributors experience significant lost income due to caregiving demands. For example, they must cut back on their own expenses, including basic necessities like food, transportation, and medical care. Kallmeyer says families need to proactively plan for the financial impact of Alzheimer's and dementia. Planning tips and more about the 2016 Facts and Figures report are available at alz.org. Early detection of disease almost always makes treatment easier and more effective, and doctors have come up with increasingly high-tech tests and scans to find disease inside the body. But one new method of early detection is decidedly low-tech, the use of dogs and other animals to sniff out disease. One of the earliest reports was in 1989 when a physician listened to his patient who said, my dog keeps biting at this mole, can you check it out? And it turned out it was a melanoma. So that was the first time that it was published, and people were pretty skeptical. That's Dr. Cindy Otto, executive director of the Penn Vet Working Dog Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Same sort of thing in the diabetic response, that there are a couple of case reports where physicians heard the story of the dogs of these clients acting differently when their blood sugar either went very, very low or very high. So people started to hear this and think, huh, there might be something there. So there was an investigation, and people started to look at it in a more scientific manner. It should really be no surprise that animals can sense things that we can't. Dr. Gary Beecham is Emeritus Director and President of the Monell Chemical Senses Center. There's a whole world of communication odors that's really outside of our realm of the senses, or at least for most people's realm of the senses. It's as if they didn't exist. You know, certain birds can detect wavelengths of light, insects as well, that we don't detect. So there's this whole area that we can't really enter into unless we use approaches such as training the animals, having them signal the presence of the odor. So that's one of the real challenges, I think, going forward in the future, and that is to try to understand how these animals are doing it, because eventually what we would like to do, obviously, is develop non-living techniques to do this, to detect these signals, so that one would have a very, very quick, easy, reproducible, and hopefully non-invasive way of doing disease diagnosis that wouldn't require bringing a dog or a ferret or a mouse into the hospital or into somebody's house to do it. But scientists have a long way to go before they can create a machine that can sniff odors as well as a dog. Dogs can smell odors that are as tiny as parts per billion, which is a really hard concept, but it's like a teaspoon of sugar in a swimming pool. So they could smell that small of an amount. And machines can't even get that close. And people are probably a thousand times to 10,000 times less sensitive than the dogs. What's more, Otto says dogs' brains are wired to make the most of that sensitivity. I like to compare it to us finding Where's Waldo? The dogs do the same sort of concept because in vision, we can block out all the things that are extraneous. We can hone in on that important thing that we're looking for, and dogs do the exact same thing. And so all of the colors and shapes and textures in our world become the odors that a dog uses for their landscape and can pick out just a very subtle difference or a subtle specific odor amongst thousands of other odors. 
most animals, I think, use a sense of smell to communicate much like we use the sense of vision to communicate. They're able to get information about other members of their species of the same sort that we can get from vision, something about the individual identity of a person, their sex, their mood, their emotions, and whether they're sick or ill. And animals do that with smell, and they probably do many more things as well. So basically what the animal is doing is doing what it naturally does with smell, and we're trying to tap into that by using animals and then eventually probably with machines to identify what the messages are and to use those in some sort of diagnostic way to diagnose human disease. Over the last couple of decades, dogs and other animals have been trained in research projects to detect prostate cancer in urine, lung cancer in breath samples, and much more. They've been able to predict seizures in epilepsy patients and find colorectal cancer, skin, and breast cancer. Scientists are even investigating whether animals can detect undiagnosed Parkinson's disease. Who knows what else? We don't know what the spectrum is. I would imagine that it's probably pretty broad because anything that has a unique odor signature, it's very possible to train a dog to recognize that and then that becomes an opportunity to have them detect that. The question becomes, what's the practical application? For diabetics, it's a wonderful application because we pair a dog and a person, and that dog can tell that person their blood sugar is dropping. And that often happens before the continuous glucose monitors will alarm. So really powerful, really changes the lives of some of these people. In research trials, dogs have been 98 to 99 percent accurate in detecting lung and prostate cancer. Otto says her dogs are about 90 percent accurate in detecting ovarian cancer. We're working with ovarian cancer and our dogs are able to identify plasma samples from patients that have ovarian cancer. Our ultimate goal is to work with our collaborators who are building electronic sensors and our chemists who are trying to identify what this odor is so that we can have a very readily available, inexpensive mass screening tool for hundreds of thousands of women that should be screened every year for this horrible disease. But that's all still in the laboratory. Out in the field, one of the few routine uses is in Tanzania and Mozambique, where giant pouched rats sniff out tuberculosis. These studies show that the rats, they can find about 70% of the patients, and they can like rule out about 80% of the healthy individuals or non-TB patients. So the sensitivity is about 70% and the specificity is about 80%. Dr. Christian Mulder is head of the TB program for the Belgian-based organization Apopo. Rats, they are really fast. They can screen 140 samples in less than 20 minutes. And if you would compare this with what a lab technician can do with a microscope, that will take about two to four days. And also, if you compare it to GeneXpert, which is one of the latest molecular assays endorsed by the WHO organization, the rats are much faster because with the GeneXpert, it takes about two hours to process four samples. Your screening of individuals goes much faster and is much cheaper. But if animals are so good at sniffing out diseases, why are scientists working so hard at creating a machine to do it that might never be as good? Otto says trusting animals to do the job can be a stretch. I think that there are people who love dogs and get it that dogs have this capacity, but there are a lot of skeptics, and so it's hard to do this research because all of the big agencies are like, what are you doing? You're doing this with dogs? You're kidding. So in order to move it forward, whether it is moving it forward with dogs doing this and being able to be validated or moving it forward in trying to get a piece of equipment that can come close to replicating the dogs, we need people to understand that this is viable. It does have huge potential and we need to find funding agencies who are willing to think that way. When you bring this to discussion with people who are in the business of doing these diagnostics, they are very skeptical. And there seems to be an inherent bias against using animals to make these diagnostic decisions. It's interesting why that should be when we obviously we use animals to make all sorts of other very, very important decisions. For example, following individuals, looking at drugs, looking at explosives, things of that sort. But most of those are simpler in a sense. They're signals that come from a single compound or a few compounds, whereas these odors of diseases, we don't really know what they are. We don't know what the animal's actually sniffing. 
because of that lack of knowledge, I think there's just this concern that even though in some study it shows it's 98% accurate, that under normal conditions in testing in a hospital, you might never reach that. Otto and Beecham say that may be true. Reliability varies from one animal to another and one day to the next. We can't say they do it all the time. And the reason that we can't say that is because they're, I guess we can't say they're human, but they're like us in that sometimes we have bad days and sometimes we have good days and sometimes we're not as focused as other times. So we're seeing that our dogs are accurate about 90% of the time. I can absolutely swear that I can train a mouse or a ferret or probably a dog, I don't work with dogs, to make these discriminations at much better than chance level. Nevertheless, much better than chance and 100% accuracy are not the same. You know, if you can just think, if you have a dog or a pet, you know that sometimes they behave very well and at other times they don't. And it's very difficult to control that sort of thing. There's kind of a subjective problem with it. You know, I think the people just are nervous about whether the animal is sufficiently consistent over long periods of time to really depend upon that. One other advantage to a machine is that it can run 24-7, and Otto says dogs can't. These dogs have to work really hard to find this tiny, tiny odor and figure out which is which. So they can work for maybe 10 or 20 minutes, and then they need a break. So it's not like we can screen as many samples. I think we can screen a large number of samples this way, but it's still pretty expensive. Plus, we have all of the training that goes into it, the maintenance of it. So it becomes economically fairly difficult. And I think it is certainly a possibility, but it's not the most likely possibility. Plus, in order to be accepted as a diagnostic test for cancer or other diseases, Otto says the use of animals would have to be FDA-approved. Among other hurdles, that would require trials that guarantee that the animal's doing it on his own and not responding to the trainer. We want to make sure that we're not having some inadvertent influence on the dogs because they are so responsive to everything we do, body language, and that is one of the biggest challenges that we face in trying to do the research is eliminating the human factor so that the dogs are really clearly telling us that this is the odor that they are detecting. But what is the odor they're detecting? It would help with credibility of the concept if we could say, yes, this is what they're smelling. But do we know? No, we don't. (laughs) We have some clues from our chemists of patterns, and that's, I think, probably the most important thing to start thinking about. We used to think that, oh, there must be an odor, a single molecule that they're smelling. I think what we're seeing is it's a pattern. So some odors change and go up and some odors change and go down. So the dogs can put together that pattern and recognize what that pattern is. Otto says there's value in skepticism because that makes scientists work harder to be perfect. But whether animals do the sniffing or machines eventually do it, Otto says what's more important is the concept that we can diagnose cancer through its odor. Once we accept that, it has enormous potential. I think it's almost limitless because it opens up a whole new realm of how we think about disease and diagnosis. And for ovarian cancer, that is such a devastating disease. And it's a silent killer. And most women aren't diagnosed until they're at stage three and four. And by then it's spread. And their chances of survival are really low. But if we could pick it up at stage one, surgery can cure them. It's a life-changing possibility, and so that's why we're so committed to this. You can find out much more about all of our guests through links on our website, radiohealthjournal.net, where you'll also find archives of our shows. You can also find them on iTunes and Stitcher. I'm Reed Pence. Radio Health Journal returns with medical notes in just a moment. Chronic pain affects nearly 100 million Americans. Research has shown quality of life can be transformed for some patients by spinal cord stimulation, but many systems remain complex and can be a barrier to meaningful pain relief. The FDA recently approved a new patient-centric spinal cord stimulation system known as the St. Jude Medical Proclaimed Spinal Cord Stimulation System. Dr. Dennis Patterson of Nevada Advanced Pain Specialists. A spinal cord stimulation system shouldn't disrupt life. The St. Jude Medical Proclaim system is intuitive to use. 
wireless, and discreet. It was clearly designed with patients in mind, and we've seen firsthand in my practice that it can improve the overall therapy experience. To take the next step to learn more about the newly approved Proclaim Spinal Cord Stimulation System, go to PowerOverYourPain.com slash next steps. That's PowerOverYourPain.com slash next steps. Implementation of a spinal cord stimulation system can involve risk, such as painful stimulation, loss of pain relief, and surgical risks, such as paralysis, during the implantation procedure. Patients should talk to their physician to determine if spinal cord stimulation therapy is right for them. Medical Notes this week. The first uterus transplant in the United States made headlines when it was performed in late February, but the uterus had to be removed from its recipient just two weeks after it was implanted. Now doctors have revealed that a common yeast infection was the cause, resulting in a compromised blood supply to the new organ. The Cleveland Clinic, where the surgery took place, has put its uterus transplant program on hold for now. People usually think of their digestive health when they take a probiotic, but before long, they may take one to prevent cavities. A study in the journal Applied and Environmental Microbiology focuses on a previously unknown strain of Streptococcus bacteria called A12. Scientists say A12 does two things that dramatically lower acid in the mouth, a major factor in cavities. First, it kills other bacteria that create acid, and it also metabolizes arginine, another major acid creator. Researchers say a probiotic with A12 could help promote oral health. And finally, a few years ago, many of you responded to a story we reported about Noah Van Houten, a little boy struggling with Batten disease. That's a rare genetic neurological disorder that gradually robs children of their sight and motor skills. We told you about the foundation Noah's parents established, noahshope.com, to fund research into what is for now a fatal disease. We're sad to report that Noah died of Batten disease complications late last month. He was 11 years old. And that's Medical Notes this week. More in a moment. Can you imagine not being able to see? Nearly 250 million people worldwide are blind or visually impaired. 80% of visual impairment can be prevented or cured, but 90% of those affected live in countries with little access to quality eye care. The solution is Orbis, a global nonprofit organization which has trained thousands of doctors and treats hundreds of thousands of patients in 78 countries aboard their Flying Eye Hospital the world's only ophthalmic teaching hospital on board a DC-10 aircraft. This summer, Orbis will launch their brand new Flying Eye Hospital, an MD-10 state-of-the-art, fully accredited eye hospital with enhanced teaching technologies. Orbis invites you to celebrate this milestone in aviation and medicine. For just a $25 donation to Orbis, you can get a behind-the-scenes tour of the Flying Eye Hospital and experience a piece of aviation history this summer in Los Angeles, Memphis, New York, Washington, D.C., or Dallas. Visit orbis.org slash launch to make your donation. Register for tours and to learn more. That's orbis.org slash launch. Thank you for listening to Radio Health Journal, a production of MediaTrax Communications. If you enjoyed this week's show, please leave a review on iTunes or share it with a friend. You can find more Radio Health Journal stories about health, science, and technology on iTunes, Stitcher, and at radiohealthjournal.net.